Good morning, Autosport International. Henry Hope Frost, a regular stage presenter, has had to have a little bit of a lie down in anticipation of interviewing his childhood hero, Nigel Mansell, later on on the stage. So in the meantime, for the first time, we're going to do a brief recording of a live Autosport podcast. I'm your host, Ed Straw, and I can't do it on my own, so we've got an all-star panel joining me to talk a little bit about Formula One 2018. First up, we have a Grand Prix winning designer and Autosport technical expert, Gary Anderson, former Grand Prix driver and Channel 4 technical analyst, Karun Chandok and also Autosport.com editor, Glenn Freeman. Now we're going to take a few questions from the floor shortly, so have a think about anything you'd like to ask our uh, all-star panel. But first up, F1 2018, where we've got the launches of the cars around the corner, testing starts late February. What are we expecting from F1 2018? Mercedes and Hamilton, victory and domination again, or a little bit more of a battle? Um, well, you know, the big boys are always hard to beat. Mercedes have got the budget, they've got the manpower, they've got the knowledge. They've won four world championships in a row, so they've got a fairly good handle on what it takes to not only build a good car, but also how to win. But I think, you know, for 2017, the one that sort of screwed up a little bit was, uh, was Red Bull. I mean, they started the season poorly, I think, and really, if they can get their act together to start the, to start the season and make it into a six-car six battle, because all those six drivers are capable of winning races, make it into a six-car battle from the beginning of the season, then it, it will put the pressure in a different way to two Mercedes. And um, they, they need something like that. They need somebody biting at their heels constantly. They had Ferrari at the beginning of the year in 17. Um, hopefully that will happen again because I think, you know, we're all Ferrari supporters. You know, it's great to see that red car up there just because of nostalgia, to be honest. But um, I think the Mercedes will do a strong job. They're really on top of it with the power unit. Um, they will do a strong job. We just need the other competition to do as strong a job. Karina, what do you reckon are the chances of that? Ferrari, we need them just to be that bit more stronger. Red Bull consistently at the front to have a, a three-car battle. I think uh, if you look back at 17, Ed, you know, we, we did the season review podcast, and if you just take the mistakes from Baku, Singapore, and then the reliability issues in Malaysia and Japan, you, you know, if you, if Ferrari and Vettel hadn't have had those bad races, they would have been the world champions. And, and really, that's the first thing they need to iron out. They, you know, I think they produced a car with a, an amazing aerodynamic package. They, they prove certainly on tracks where you need a dirty downforce to be the most competitive package. But across the season, I think they, they made a, a fantastic step forward um, from 16. A and, and really, they need to now put the season together. I think Gary highlighted the fact that Mercedes have won the last four world championships. They're, they're unquestionably the top, top team in this V6 hybrid era. But I think operationally, there's still a better team um, on, on the race weekends. You know, we've seen days where on the Friday, they've looked a bit out of sorts and, and behind the game. But when it comes to Q3, Lewis is able to dig deep and deliver the lap. And that then sets him up for the Sunday because he's got track position. Um, but for me, the biggest question is what can Renault do for over the winter? Because, um, you know, in terms of performance, Yes, they're not, they, they don't have the same performance as a Mercedes or Ferrari, but they weren't bad. They were still able to win you know, races on merit in Mexico and, and Malaysia. But the reliability obviously wasn't great, uh, particularly in the second half. So for me, if they can get, get their act together over the winter, we could have eight teams, because obviously we've got McLaren in there as well. And we've got eight, uh, sorry, eight cars, eight drivers and four teams, um, and eight very, very good drivers who could all be fighting it out. Now, Glenn, as Autosport.com editor, you have a very clear idea of what fans get excited about when the season, the first half of the year in particular, a really close battle between Lewis Hamilton and Sebastian Vettel. Traffic was up, loads of fan interest, and I think everybody here will want to see a good close fight. So how important is it that we have a, a season that is at least as good as the first two-thirds of last year and ideally a step beyond? Yeah, I think all F1 fans want to go into Grand Prix weekends, not necessarily knowing which driver is going to win the race and which car is going to win the race. And we were fortunate in 2017 that we finally had that again. It wasn't always a Mercedes versus a Mercedes. My concern, and this is something Gary touched on when we were talking backstage, was uh, I think last year was we finally saw Mercedes have some off days with their car. And my worry is that we're not going to get that two years in a row. So if they iron out the things they struggled with with last year's car, they could actually be slightly further ahead. So there's a, I think there's a lot of pressure on the other teams to make an even bigger step than Mercedes can. 
Gary, are you expecting to see much change from Mercedes? Is it going to be evolutionary, or do you think we're going to start to see them explore the potential of the higher rake strategy that Red Bull in particular have taken and Ferrari to a slightly lesser extent have gone down that route? Yeah, I think if you if you look at their car this year, I mean, they, they went for this longer wheelbase. I mean, the, the objective of that was because of the, the bigger front tires. Um, it, it creates a lot more turbulent airflow, and you basically want that airflow to be able to be organized or settled down by the time it gets to the leading edge of the side pod. So Mercedes went for the longer wheelbase, moved the front wheels forward, basically, whereas Ferrari came up with a fairly trick leading edge to the side pod to allow that to happen. So they've got that to think about. You know, that If you look in general, the Ferrari was a better car on low-speed tracks. Monaco, Hungary, Singapore, it was definitely a better car than the Mercedes. The Mercedes was the better car when it came to the high-speed tracks, you know, a fast cir circuits like Silverstone, Spa, et cetera. But there wasn't much in it at any point in time, so it's only a little bit out. And uh, Red Bull run this high rake. In other words, they get the, by running the high rake, they get the, uh, the diffuser to be a bigger volume. In other words, the gap from the diffuser to the ground is bigger. And as long as you can seal off the airflow down the sides of the car in front of the rear tires, in theory, you have more underbody downforce. But you also get the front wing lower in low-speed corners because um, the downforce on the car pushes the car into the ground. And low-speed corners, you've got less downforce. So the front wing's lower to the ground. So in low-speed corners, where a Formula 1 car typically has lots of understeer, um, they have more front, front wings. So there's a combination of little bits there. It's like a jigsaw building it up. Um, and you need to make sure that you start with your, all the bits of the, the, of the jigsaw that are correct fit together somehow, and then the team's got to decide how they fit them together. And that's still always the, the challenge, really, to be honest. I don't expect Mercedes to come out with a car that's you know, 20 centimeters shorter wheelbase and running five centimeters higher rear ride height. That would be stupid. But sort of halfway there might be a nice thing. And you might see the Ferrari going halfway there the other direction. So it's all a, bit, a combination of little bits and pieces. But Mercedes, um, you know, as, as Karen said, you know, come Q3 on a Saturday afternoon, Lewis Hamilton, and that's a big word really, Lewis Hamilton was able to find that lap time that give, that give Mercedes a very good opportunity on Sundays. Um, and Lewis has driven exceptionally well in 2017. I mean, probably his best season in reality of feeling the grip of the car and just getting that lap out of it when it counted. Um, and his accident in Brazil in, Q, in Q1 really was, was something that I was totally unexpected because that again was, the car was moving on the bumps and that's whenever the aerodynamics underneath the car is very inconsistent. So it just, just caught him out a little bit. So, you know, he's an exceptional driver. If you give him the tools to do the job, he'll do a very, very strong job. Mercedes are very good at it. So they just got to be careful not to try to go a route that they don't understand. But what, what I'd like to see is these other teams, as Karen says again, maybe eight cars at the front. Because if you can change the pressure on Mercedes, maybe they will trip up a little bit. Just change the pressure from doing a good job to, to actually having to react to other people, and it might be just a bit different. And I think um, we saw that, didn't we, a couple of times, where in Melbourne, for example, Lewis had the lead, had track position, and yet they, they chose to pit, and he ended up in traffic. And and that was, I think, an effect of, for the first time in a long time, Mercedes were under pressure from another team. You know, they had Vettel there, and really, he could have just driven around, keeping Vettel behind and still won the race, but, but they made a mistake. Uh, and the same in Bahrain. I think they, you know, they, they, they um, allowed Vettel to undercut them effectively, but because they had Valtteri in the mix, and he was struggling with ties and all sorts. So um, there were a couple times, but I thought, strategically and operationally, Mercedes... Were, were under pressure from another team, uh, and that sort of threw them off a bit. Yeah, the one thing, Karen, I think you and I are very, very good at is hindsight. I mean, whenever you're on the pit wall and you've got to make these decisions, it's, it's so different. You know, you're just trying to balance out the fact you've got, whatever, 30 more laps of the race to go. Where will you be in 25 laps time? So you can't, you have to do something. The worst thing you can ever do is do nothing. So you have to do something, and you're either going to get um, mm. the blame or the glory, one of the two. The thing is that the, the examples we talk about were at the start of the season when it was new to Mercedes to have such a strong challenger. And if you look at the way they finished the season, you think of a race like Spa, for example, they didn't trip over themselves. They didn't make those mistakes. I think they reacted to the challenge of Ferrari and actually ended the season stronger than they started it. Well, I've asked enough questions now, ideally. I'd like to know if anyone on the floor has any questions. Simon down there has a microphone, so hand in the air and we'll get a microphone out to you to ask questions to any or all of the panel. Hi. Um, the halo that's coming in this year, 
um, obviously safety is important. Where do you see that going? Do you see completely closed cockpits? Um, I, I'll be honest, I'm not a massive fan of the Halo. Um, I think it, on the one side, uh, of course, if, you know, you, if you go down the, the path that if, if it saves even one life, then it's worth it, yes. But on the flip side, I think aesthetics are important in, in motorsport. You know, it's, m motor racing is an emotional thing. In, in order to attract fans in, um, you know, I still look at a Jordan 191 and, and think that is one of the most beautiful race cars I've ever seen. And, and uh, you know, I will still spend 20 minutes staring at it because it's a beautiful race car. And I think y you can't underestimate that from a, a, from a fan's standpoint. Uh, as a driver, you know, at the end of the day, I think every driver accepts the risks. Um, I never felt under pressure to get into a race car. Um, uh, I was never being forced to get into a race car. I did it voluntarily, accepting that you might have an injury, you might get hurt or, or something worse. And, um, and ultimately, if you don't like those risks, then go do something else. Um, and I think it's a very, very tricky balance with safety because on the one side, the FIA's job is to keep the sa sport safe, but on the flip side, you have to, to balance it with, um, with the aesthetics of it all, I think. And to me, it doesn't look like a completed solution. Um, and if you're gonna do it, then do the closed cockpit. I mean, um, if, I don't know if there's a, there's a prototype here somewhere I saw earlier, but you know, the, the, the Le Mans cars, they look beautiful. I, think, I don't think anybody will say that the Le Mans prototype with the closed cockpit is an ugly car. You know, they look fantastic. So if, you might, if you're gonna go down that path, you might as well research it and go, go the whole hog. Uh, otherwise, I'm a bit of a purist and a traditionalist. And I think we, we you, you know, you, you can't, this halfway solution doesn't quite work for me. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like going back in time, in my opinion. You, you do this big space frame thing that goes around the top of the chassis onto a, a very highly engineered, technical, material chassis, carbon fibre. But from my point of view, I, I don't, you'll, ever, you'll never get a catch-all situation. It won't cure every accident. Yes, the halo will be very good if a, a wheel and an upright tyre is coming at you. But as far as smaller debris is concerned, I, I worry about it getting trapped inside the halo now, between the, he the headrest and the halo. So... You know, it's, it's a bit sad. I think that we all look at Formula One cars on this step nose section as being fairly ugly. And I would have liked them to have just basically changed the geometry of the chassis a bit within the regulations. It meant in front of the driver was a bit more of a, a ramp section. Get rid of that stupid hump on the flat top chassis because it, no matter who you are, they do look horrible. And I think you could put a, a fairly low deflector on there that would help to reduce a lot of stuff, including tire wheels and tires, springs like Felipe Massa in Hungary, um, you know, bits of debris. I'm worried now about a front wing getting knocked off a car, coming up, getting caught in the halo where the driver's head is, because it can't get out again. So there's, there's never a right way, there's never a wrong way, but as Karen says, if it saves one life, well, so be it. But it's not the best solution, I don't believe at all in any way. I mean, all these teams make new chassis every year, so to change the chassis geometry and alter it so that there was a bit of a ramp effect in front of the driver, it wouldn't be that difficult. And I think fundamentally, if you made it an optional thing, every driver on the grid would say no, because it adds seven, eight, nine kilos, something like that, uh, maybe more, and it's and it's high up as well, you know, for the CFG, uh, and it's. Uh, I'm sure Gary can tell you much more than me, but I'm sure it's not good for the um, aerodynamic flow. Well, it's not good for aerodynamics, but it's a small disadvantage, I believe. I mean, there's a little bit, but I think that the engineers will overcome that. The problem is, is it's more like 14 or 15 kilograms. It's very high up, so it isn't going to do the tires any good. Obviously, the lap time will just suffer because of the mass of the car. And 10 kilograms of fuel in the car um, is about three tenths or a little bit more than three tenths of a second slower per lap. Now, when you put more fuel in the car, you actually lower the center of gravity because the, the fuel is, the first part of the fuel is below the CAG of the car. So you actually lower the center of gravity. Whereas with this headrest thing, putting those 14 kilograms or whatever, that high up, you never lower the center of gravity. So that will all be worse for the car itself. Um, so again, you know, engineering wise, it's, just, it's not a nice thing as an engineer to, to look to try and optimize it, but also aesthetically, it's pretty poor. I think it's an intermediate step. Like Karun said, I think it's, it, it, it's the most ready solution at the time they want to introduce one. We've tried a few different screen designs, the one we saw in the Red Bull, 
the one we saw on the Ferrari. And I think they look better, but they had their own problems. I think the Red Bull screen didn't it fail in its FIA test, and the Ferrari screen made Vettel feel sick at Silverstone. What I would say about the Halo is if you, if you watch it from trackside in person, when the cars are going around, it doesn't look as bad. It looks at its worst in still images, which is what most of us have looked at a lot of the time. So I think we may get used to it, particularly if they have liveries on them. But yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a great solution. We'll discuss it in, um, on the stage next year, shall we? <laughs> whether we got used to it or not. Yeah, just let me add one thing. Just the, the fact you know, we all drive a car that's got a windscreen in front of us. This bloke here is driven around Le Mans in the dark with a dirty windscreen at you know, 200 odd miles an hour. Oh, it's not that quick. Not Carew. Shut up. 198. But, um, the thing is, you get used to all this stuff. So for Vettel to go out and say it made me sick doing one lap of Silverstone, I think that's pretty poor, actually. You know, you're trying to do something to go forward, and for one driver or a driver to come around and say that, maybe the screen had some distortion, maybe it was just a prototype. But as, as you said earlier, look at some of these WEC cars sitting around here. They look gorgeous. They've got a good screen there. Yes, you may need a carbon rim around the top of it, like the halo in a way, to support the end of the screen. But that's all possible. You know, and I think it's a very lame excuse that this thing in front of me, I can't drive with this because it made me sick. Because we all drove here today looking through a windscreen. Do we have another question? Hand in the air. And down here, Simon. Uh, Ferrari have been making claims to leave the sport in uh, 2021. Uh, what are your views on uh, them leaving, or if they will leave the sport or not? I have a new question of the Ferrari quit threats. Um, I, th I think, you know, we've, we've heard these sort of things happen for, for, for many years. I mean, you're probably not old enough to have heard most of them, but um, there have been a they sort of come periodically, don't they? And the Formula One is um, is a political minefield. Um, 2021 is a is again is the next critical juncture where the teams um, have to commit to the the next chunk of years, shall we say, in the sport. But also the technical rules. And and at the moment, there's a lot of um, the sports. I personally believe the sport is at a crossroads. Um, there, are, they, you know, the, you've got manufacturers who want to go down one path, um, and we've seen them commit to Formula E because they believe the path is um, electric mobility. Um, but on the flip side, the, the fans and the entertainment side is almost um, the opposite. You know, you want loud v 12 screaming engines and, uh, and entertainment. So I think the sport is at a bit of a crossroads in 2021, and, and all of this stuff that we're, we're going to hear lots of it over the next couple of years from the, I think the certainly the three big teams, but you'd probably throw McLaren in there as well. Uh, there's going to be a lot of lobbying that goes on and a lot of threats and counter threats and, and, and all sorts, really. Yeah, it's unfortunate that Ferrari always do this when they think they, there's some political ground to be gained. I don't think they'll pull out, but I also don't think that F1 as a championship will have the, the guts to completely take Ferrari on. So I think Ferrari will get some of what they want, and that'll be enough for them to stay. But unfortunately, like Karun says, we're probably going to have another year or two of you know, political moaning and threats being made in the Italian media. And it does get a bit tedious. Gary, you've been on the inside of this, more on the technical side than the commercial side. But what's it like when you're going through this period of trying to agree new commercial agreements and technical rules? When you hear something like Ferrari, is it just, uh, not again, does anyone take it seriously? Or is it, or is it just part of the, part of the game? Well, um, yeah, sort of part of the game. I, I was involved you know, through the 90s and 2000s. And if you take the time when, when Ayrton Senna was killed at Emel in 1994, I think Formula One stood in its best position ever after that to try and come up with some solutions for safety. And you know, we had a technical working group that met and was very, very constructive uh, during that period. And, and basically that, that relationship or that technical working group is what's responsible for the safety of the cars currently. And um, at those meetings, Ferrari was probably the only team that actually stood in the way of most stuff. You know, they, they liked to exert their muscle. And it made it very difficult for the small teams. I was always a small team guy, but you know, Ferrari have always stood in the way and made sure that it was in their interests what they were doing as opposed to anybody else's interests. And while you've got that philosophy, then change is very, very difficult. I think Ferrari need to wake up to the fact that it's, it's you, the public, that make them exist in Formula One. Um, you know, they're not there because Formula One is a great thing other than the fact that you, as the public, want to see it. 
We have to make the sport better. We have to make it more interesting. I would say if you, if you turn the TV on you know, to a program, you'll give it a couple of minutes to see if it sucks you in and you want to watch the rest of it. And if it doesn't suck you in, you'll go to some other channel. We've got, you know, I don't know how many thousand channels now we, <laughs> we can choose from. It's not like the days that we had BBC One, Two and Three. Um, it's a lot of channels there now. So you have to make Formula One suck you in. And Formula One at the moment, if, if my mum or dad or whoever it was turned it on, they wouldn't want to watch what's going on. It's, it's, it's useless. And Ferrari are part of that, that sort of racing. Very few races have interesting stuff happening from front to back. It's just bits of it that make it good. If you switch the TV on during those bits, it's fine. If you don't, if you switch it on during the lull, then it's horrible. So they have to make it good for everybody, and Ferrari need to buy into that. Ed, should we do a show of hands? Would people, who would keep watching Formula One if Ferrari pulled out? That's a pretty good, pretty good selection. Right. So. There's a message for Ferrari, isn't it? I think the bottom line is Ferrari want what they want, and pulling out of F1 isn't something Ferrari wants. It's all, all part of the negotiation. I think there's a young lad here who had a question. Didn't quite pick that up. But the question was about McLaren. You know, how competitive do you think McLaren would be? Gary, you're, you're fond of making pronouncements about McLaren. You've, you've been <laughs> talking them up for several years, or was it the other way? What um, do you think? Renault engines this year, of course. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm very disappointed in McLaren. McLaren are a team that are close to my heart. I worked for them for a few years way back in the late 70s, um, early 80s. But um, I think one of the things with them, obviously, they're... They've sort of got left behind. Whenever they used a Mercedes engine in, what, 2014, um, you know, they didn't beat Mercedes, really, to be honest. They, they, they struggled a little bit. So they, had a they have a lot to do for themselves. But then they got the Honda engine. And whenever you're a, a, a team using one engine in the pit lane, you've either got um, pressure to make it all work, or you've done a really good deal and the engine is just a mega, or it has problems. Um, and in Honda's case, they had problems. But nobody seemed to want to fix that. So. I, my criticism of Ferrari, was, of, of McLaren, was the fact that they always seemed to run their car at a level of downforce that meant the car was very, very good. And Spa is a very typical example. The first section of the track is all about high speed. The last section of the track is all about high speed. And the middle section is all about car handling. Now, the problem is in the middle section, nobody can really pass you. You can get past in the first section and the last section. So they always run lots of downforce. Um, they're good through that middle section and they're you know, the fastest car and they've got the best car on the pit lane but they're very slow in the first section they're very slow on the, on the last section it's a compromise you, you always set the car up at the best compromise for the lap time and I don't think McLaren as a team ever did that so I think they, they highlighted Honda's problems which for sure Honda weren't good I'm not, not, I'm not knocking McLaren here needlessly I'm just saying that I think it was better for them to do now they'll get judged against Renault with Red Bull um, and Renault themselves. So they've, they've now got nobody to hide, I suppose, is the best way of putting it. Yeah, 100% agree. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the key now is there's no way to hide, you know, and especially a guy like Alonso, he just ramps up the pressure, you know, as soon as, as, soon as the Renault deal was announced in Singapore, all his pressure turned to woking, you know, in terms of, right, boys, now you've got the engine, come on. You, you've got to deliver the car, we have to be Red Bull, and you, you, he is, I mean, I think the guy would be a political genius, really, Alonso, you know, he, he plays those games all the time, and he, he just, he completely cranks the pressure on to whoever he believes needs to deliver. Um, you know, he's, he's an utterly brilliant racing driver, um, but at the same time, he, he can't be an easy person to work for, because uh, um, he, he He's, he just doesn't leave anyone with room to hide, you know, I think. And he's gone straight up and said, if Red Bull won three races this year, well, we've got to win three races next year. Or whatever they win, we have to win the equal amount plus one. And um, as Gary said, you know, when you're, when you're a team with the only engine on the grid, you've got some scope to hide. Next year, they haven't. I think the bare minimum for McLaren next year is fourth in the Constructors' Championship and podiums. Karun's right that, you know, Fernando's going to be aiming a lot higher than that. And so he should. And I think the main thing is it'd be good for F1 if McLaren's car is as good as they've been telling us it is for the last couple of years. Because then they'll be right there with Red Bull, hopefully Ferrari and Mercedes. And that's what we want. We need more teams at the front now. Do you have any more questions? Hands in the air. Just going back a little bit to TV, how much of a difference is uh, Channel 4 pulling out so there'll be no more free to view 
Formula One in the future. So I, I actually missed the bit. What happens when there's no more free to view F1? When F, uh, I'll be signing on the doll. <laughs> Wait, they pay you to do that? <laughs> I thought you were like um, a pay driver. No, I, I mean, I think it, it's, a, it's back to the commercial things. You know, unfortunately, I, I think it's a shame. And I'm not saying this purely from, a, from the fact that I actually work with Channel 4, because um, I think from a global standpoint, I think it's a really tricky balance. The money obviously comes in from from the private broadcasters, the satellite broadcasters around the world. But I think back to how I got inspired to to become a Grand Prix driver, uh, and it's because I could. Uh, and in India, we didn't get television. The first um, race was the Barcelona Grand Prix in 1993. I used to get friends of mine from the UK to send me BBC recordings, so I'd watch the races two, three months later on VHS. But the reason I wanted to be a racing driver is I could watch Nigel Mansell and Alain Prost and Ayrton Senna and, and, and one day dream of being that person. Uh, and the same for, if you look at the number of engineers and mechanics in, in, the, in the paddock, a lot of them from the UK, still I think you'd probably say the majority are from the UK, um, but you know, all around Europe. And a lot of them got inspired to get involved in the sport because they could turn on the TV and was there free to watch. Now, if only a quarter of the population, and, and it is, you know, essentially the difference is probably, a, you know, one third or one fourth the audience are watching it, that's a, a significant number uh, of people who are not going to be inspired. And the si a similar thing has happened in cricket. If you, if you, I read some articles. Um, where the ECB are talking about how since they've gone to satellite viewership for, for test cricket and, and a lot of cricket, um, they're struggling to get participation from school kids because they're not watching it and therefore they're not inspired to be um, the, the next Joe Root or whatever. So I, I think that's, that's one element that we shouldn't ignore. Um, and, and I'm not just saying that from a UK standpoint. I think that's a, that's a global standpoint is how do you get these, these young lads interested and inspired to get involved, not just as a driver, because as a driver, it's a minority, but in terms of being an engineer or a journalist or whatever, there's, you know, you have to inspire people in. Yeah, I, I sort of look at it slightly differently in a way that there's a reason that, that a company like Sky basically now have a TV station and they charge for the use of it, pay-per-view. And they then pay more money to Formula One or to the Premiership or to whatever to get that program. And they, they pay more money to get it exclusively. So I think, you know, we're responsible for that bet. You know, we, you, everybody here who pay for uh, pay for pay-per-view TV means they have more money, they pay more money, and suddenly the, the BBC or Channel 4 don't get the deal anymore because it's all about money. And if we stop paying Sky, then it would go back and say, whoa, we need to get this back on a, on a preview uh, TV channel because they'll pay us X. The, the Y that Sky used to pay us isn't available anymore. So it's, uh, it's, it's going to go that way because it's about money. It's about money. But Liberty Media now have them bought into Formula One as well, are bought over from Bernie. Basically, they need to stand up and be counted as well as McLaren because, uh, again, they've been in there for a year. The, the honeymoon period's over. Uh, it's time to stand up and... Uh, see where they're going to go with it all, and, and TV is part of that. And actually, on the subject of, of the TV, just a quick show of hands again. How many people here who watch F1 are reliant on the terrestrial coverage, the non-Sky coverage, to watch it? So that's a reasonable number, a good half or so, so that shows how important it is. I think what's interesting is maybe what happens next. Gary mentioned F1's new ownership. They're clearly going to look at some sort of maybe online model where fans don't have to pay maybe Sky money to get access to watching F1 and it'll be interesting to see if for a smaller amount of money there would be people who would be prepared to get an F1 sort of subscription service maybe. Yeah, and I mean that's an interesting point is people have talked about doing it um, through the watching races through the app or Netflix or Amazon or pl different platforms like that. But I mean, I, I, I don't know, I, I find watching sport is something you do with your friends. Um, I don't want to be sitting watching a Grand Prix or a or a, or a game on my phone or tablet. I want to sit there with my friends and have lunch and, and banter and chat and, and I, I don't know. It's, I don't think watching, um, 
watching it on a little little screen is the same as sitting around in a room full of people and, and hurling abuse at each other about it. <laughs> That's a fair point. Any more questions? Hands in the air. Do we have anyone? Okay, well, we can, we've got a few more topics up here. Um, Corinne, one of the things we've talked about quite a bit on the Autosport podcast was the possibility of the Robert Kubica return, uh, initially with Renault and then subsequently with Williams, and obviously that race chance has uh, diminished significantly. What have you made of the, of the whole thing and what you've heard about his level of performance with the, the injury he's got? I think, um, as you say, that, that whole um, momentum seems to have, have died down a bit. Uh, it certainly looks like uh, he's not going to be in a race seat next year. There's some talk about him doing some Fridays or something. But um, it, it's a shame for him. But at the end of the day, I think they, the, the, they gave him plenty of opportunities to, to, to really prove that he deserved the seat in a, in a meritocratic way. Um, you know, I, I can't think of many other drivers who have had this many opportunities with two teams to test and prove themselves uh, capable of having a, a race seat. So I, I don't think you, ca you can say he hasn't had a fair, fair chance to be evaluated. And it's a shame because, um, you know I, know, I know Robert quite well. We've been friends since we raced together back in uh, World Series in 2005. And he, he's, he's a great lad. And, and, and at, the, at his peak before his accident, he was utterly brilliant. But the reality is teams can't hire drivers based on the past. They have, to, they have to hire drivers based on their circumstances and their performance today. And uh, yeah, it's a, sh it's a shame for the sport and it's a shame for, for Robert, obviously, that it's, um, it's not quite worked out. It's a shame, but I also think it's, it's right that he was judged on merit and didn't get any special yes. treatment. And it is, it's a real shame. We, I think when two teams have a look at you, as Karun said, then we know that there's clearly something something missing. I think I don't know what you heard, Karun, but it sounded to me like it was it was the ultimate one lap pace that was maybe the issue more than the long runs. And Formula One's so tight now that if you are that little bit off the pace in qualifying, you're going to be out in Q1 every time, and then your whole weekend's compromised over and over again for the same reason. Yeah, again, I think m it's more down to the bank balance, how thick your wallet is. To be honest, it's uh, that he's missing out on the end of the day. You know, I, I believe in his talent. I don't think that you can actually jump into a Renault Formula One car or a Williams Formula One car on a, a one-day test as such and just drive the wheels off it. I think the long-run pace, if it was there, that you'd know that the, uh, the, the one-lap pace will come because you just need to have confidence. You need to have confidence in the car around you to be able to do that. And then unfortunately, I think he's losing out because of bank, bank balance. He doesn't, he's not able to come with the money that's, uh, that's required. And just, just carrying on, just going back a little bit further, and I hope it, it all happens. I, I was, Alex Zanardi drove for Jordan, his first time in Formula One was in the uh, Jordan 191. Um, and I was at the Louser's ring whenever he lost his legs as well. And it's uh, typical of a, an injury coming back. It was great to see him coming back in a different formula to do the, to do the job, because obviously coming back in the single seaters is, is very, very difficult. And now we have Billy Munger, and, and I hope that he can take something from, from Alex Zanardi and the fact that, you know, the world isn't always about these little single-seater things. Well, um, you, can, you can have a great racing career in other formulas, and it's more, it's easier probably to do, to cater for the requirements in other formulas than it is in Formula One. So, coming back from injury for Kubica, um, yes, but he should, he should look at other formulas. It's not just, the world is not just about Formula One. Do we have any tips for a surprise package this year? We've got a few teams on the up. Renault, the works team, obviously, came on strongly towards the end of last year. Do we expect them to be able to make the step from the, the kind of the rest across that big chasm between fourth and third to be at least snapping at the heels of the, of the big teams, perhaps with McLaren? I think um, that comes back to exactly what Glenn was saying before, that, that, that midfield pack, if you're missing three tens in qualifying, then all of a sudden, you're, you're, you haven't qualified 7th or 8th, you've qualified 14th or 15th, and your weekend looks completely different. And all it is, is three tenths on one lap in Q2. That, that's, that's a differentiator. Um, and for Williams, it's a really tricky position they're, they're in, because you know, if they're missing um, a chunk of pace in qualifying with, with the two drivers that they end up with, all of a sudden, both Renault and McLaren have tremendous potential to, to leap ahead of them in the constructors. And, you know, for, Force India have got two 
very, very good drivers. Ocon's going to be even better next year. And you have to probably say that he was the rookie of the year um, in 17. So, um, you know, it, it's a really tricky little battle in the midfield. But um, as far as surprises, I think uh, the, 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 the one that I'm really interested to see is can Red Bull get it together in terms of the Milton Keynes side in the straight off the bat uh, and in terms of the Viri side um, across the season? Yeah, Red Bull need to start well, don't they? I think we all know that they can develop a car possibly better than anyone else through a season. But we always seem to get to test in Australia and there's something missing with the car of late. And I know, Gary, we went to the first test last year and you saw the covers came off the car and you were sort of thinking they're missing something here. It was as if all the parts weren't on the car. But looking further back down the field, I would say that I reckon it's bad news for Force India. They've done such a good job to be the fourth best team over and over again. I think the resurgence of McLaren, and I do think Renault will continue what they were doing like, towards the end of last year when they had the fourth quickest car, and that's just going to shunt those teams like Force India and Williams back down the pecking order. Hey, I wouldn't just jump in there and say that. Williams, maybe, because Williams, Williams are a team that have lost their way. I mean, 2014, they were very strong. Um, they seemed to be right up there. They were the, the biggest challenge to Mercedes. But as the years went by, they seemed to go the wrong direction. Force India have been building up. The Force India know why they're there. Whenever you can go up that slope nicely, or as I always put it, it's like climbing a ladder, you know? There's a certain amount of steps on it, and the more steps you have to take, um, the, more, the more opportunity you've got. As long as you have got a head for heights, you're okay. Um, Force India have been stepping up that ladder slowly, step by step, and I think they can make another step. I think they can, they probably can't finish in the top three teams, but I think they can move closer again. As I said last year, the, the, big, the big challenge is be closer to that third team. Never mind the fact you're going to beat them. Just be closer there. Make sure you try and bring, build the cushion behind you. So I expect Force India to do a good job. The one thing I'd love to see doing a good job is Honda coming back with a, a rocket ship in a Toro Rosso. That would be and, funny. Um, <laughs> and then moving on to Red Bull the year after so that everybody goes, what happened there? It's Fernando Alonso being lapped by Pierre Gasly in a Toro Rosso <laughs> Honda. A bit true to Fernando Alonso's luck, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, his decision making has been a bit strange during through the years of um, of moving from team to team, and maybe this Honda could be another lesson in that uh, in that lessons of life. So, Gary, you know people from Force India well from your time at Jordan. That that is old, your old team in many respects. Do you genuinely think that they could hang on to fourth and stay ahead of McLaren and Renault? Yeah, I genuinely believe it. They've got a strong team there. A big percentage of them are still the same. Andrew Green was one of the original guys with me that uh, designed the, the Jordan 191. He's technical director. Real good head on his shoulders. And, you know, I see no reason why they can't shut the gap down to, to P3, meaning that hopefully they'll eliminate others from leapfrogging them. So all the best to them. They're a really good team. They're a, a team that I think we all relate to because they're just a normal group of people. They're not, the politics are a lot less enforced into than they are further up the grid. Well, we hope that's given you a little bit of a excitement ahead of the 2018 Formula One season. You'll be able to follow it all on, on autosport.com. The Autosport podcast is available free, so just search for it on whichever podcast supplier you have. Just search for Autosport, listen to it free. So thanks to Gary Anderson, Corinne Chandock and Glenn Freeman. And thanks for listening from myself, Ed Straw. We'll be back soon with another yeah, Autosport podcast. <laughs>